Welcome to the Benzo Free Podcast, your home for an honest, straightforward, and personal discussion about anti-anxiety drugs, their effects, and how to deal with dependence and withdrawal. Whether you have taken benzodiazepines, Z drugs, or any other tranquilizers, know someone who has, or you just want help dealing with chronic anxiety and insomnia, this is your podcast. I'm your host, D.E. Foster, author of the book, Benzo Free, The World of Anti-Anxiety Drugs and the Reality of Withdrawal. I'm so glad you joined us today. Please stick around and let me bend your ear for a few minutes. You just might feel a little better on the other side. Hello there, this is Dee, and welcome to episode 104 of the Benzo Free Podcast. And welcome to our second Benzo Chat. This is a fun one, and I think you're going to like it. But before we kick it off, I want to catch you up on a few things. I'll keep this short, I promise. I'm back home now, and I just got back from another funeral. Unfortunately, back in Missouri, my cousin passed away with COVID, my first cousin, and... I had to go back there, or I wanted to go back there for the funeral. It does seem to be a trend for me lately with the funerals in, in Kansas and Missouri, but I'm hoping this is the last one for some time. My health is doing better. I still have the lingering symptoms of what we think is long COVID, but I'm doing better, and I really appreciate to everyone who has reached out and asked how I was doing and checked on me. It's been, it's been really nice to have that, and I appreciate the support to everyone. For those of you who aren't on our YouTube channel or don't get notifications, I wanted to let everybody know that I did post a new video presentation on July 31st on our Benzo Free YouTube channel. That's at youtube.com slash Benzo Free if you want to check it out. It is a video presentation and it was not released as a podcast episode. So unless you go to our channel, our YouTube channel, or go to the link on our website at easinganxiety.com, you won't be able to see it unless you go to one of those two places. But it was actually a presentation that I did on a new you, Life After Benzo Withdrawal, about a 40 to 45 minute presentation I did for Benzo Warrior. And I think it came out pretty well. And I hope you check it out if you haven't already. There is a direct link to that episode in our show notes. And I think that's mostly what I had to catch up on. I'm doing pretty good. Still trying to catch up on things and get ahead of things. A lot of work going on with the benzodiazepine action work group and all the other things that we've talked about. But, you know, now's not the time for me to elaborate on that because we have this benzo chat to share today. And it's really good. And I had a lot of trouble trying to find something to edit, edit out of it. And I didn't find much to edit out. So it's a little longer. So I want to leave as much time for it as possible. But so today's episode is a benzo chat. It's our second one. And it was recorded on June 5th on that same road trip that we recorded the first one with Rob. If you haven't checked out the one with Rob, please do so. You can see it on our YouTube channel, or actually listen to it on our YouTube channel, or also on our podcast carriers. It was episode 103, the one just before this one. But this one's completely different. It's a, it's a casual conversation amongst friends. It's just two people who deal with bind every day, and the two people, their wives, who take care of them. So me and my wife and Steve and his wife. There's a lot of honesty in this one, but also some good advice, I think, for getting through the difficult times of protracted withdrawal. A couple of things I do want to mention up front. My wife and I were just in the middle of, actually not in the middle of, but we were no longer contagious, according to our doctors, but we were still dealing with the lingering cough of what we thought was respiratory <laughs> virus and we now think was COVID, but so we do cough up occasionally. There also was rain coming down, so you hear some background sound. So the sound quality is mixed because of the environment, but I still think it comes out pretty well. I also want to remind everyone that nothing presented here on this podcast, including throughout our entire Benzo conversation, is medical advice. This is all for informational purposes only. I think that should cover it, and I don't want to delay too far, so let's dive in. Let's join four friends, some pizza, some cookies, some rain, and a bit of conversation. Hello, everybody. This is Dee. I am sitting here near Cedar Rapids, Iowa. I am sitting here with my wife. Shanna is with us. Want to say hi? Hi, everybody. 
We have been on our road trip for a while, kind of going through um, upper Midwest of the U.S., and we're now popping back in Iowa on the way back to Kansas City, and we are sitting here at the home. Um, Steve, we have... <laughs> I should probably preface this a little bit, but um, we, we're at the home with Steve and Heather here at, near Cedar Rapids, Iowa, and they were so kind to actually bring us in. They fed us pizza. <laughs> we're now eating these great cookies that Steve made, and we're sitting out on their patio just relaxing, and I thought it'd be great if we could just record a chat with everybody um, because, you know, we can talk about what we've been through. So I don't know if you guys want to say hi, Steve. Want to say hi? Hi there, everybody. And Heather, you want to say hi? Hi. There we go. So now we got four people. See? Um, and it's always awkward because when the recorder starts, everybody kind of freezes up because they don't know what to say. But we've been chatting for like an hour and a half nonstop, but of course the recorder goes and we suddenly get quiet. <laughs> but actually what I would like to do before we get too far is give about one minute for Steve to tell his story real quick as far as Benzos go so you all can understand where he's coming from. Steve, would you like to do that real quick? Sure. Thanks. So um, my Benzo story um, is... A little bit longer than I'd like to admit, um, but I really just got sick one day with the flu and didn't react very well to the antibiotic, didn't know what was going on, and then I was sent from doctor to doctor to doctor until I was all of a sudden put on a benzo, which I never knew the word benzo <laughs> until many years later, um, and I knew I just never felt right on them. And just kept saying to my doctor, I need to get off these. And um, then at that time, the doctor said, well, you can't do it in the winter here in Iowa. Uh, you'll need to wait until the spring. And I said, okay. Again, still not knowing what it was. And then I went to him and he said, okay, you can get off today. And I said, great. And... Do you know why he said not winter? Uh, just due to seasonal um, okay. depression. I think oh, okay. he thought, you know, if you're on these kind of medicines that you shouldn't be doing this in the winter. Okay. Your, maybe your vitamin D levels are very low here in the Midwest during that time when we don't get a lot of sunshine. Okay. And then we, um, I stopped <laughs> and um, <laughs> pretty much went cold turkey and did not know why in the world I was so not feeling myself Yeah. and kept going to work uh, and kept raising children and kept doing everything and just feeling weird all the time. And I finally, and we were talking about this, Heather and I, just recently, I don't even know when I figured out what benzos really were. Um, and then I would come home, I'd look at the bottle of medicine, I'm like, maybe it's some of the medicine. And it was like, okay. And then by the time I got back to work, I couldn't, of course, remember the name. So then about the fifth <coughs> time I think I did it, I wrote it down, and then I started Googling. And then, again, as us in the benzo community know, um, there wasn't a lot of information, excuse me, information back then. And it was like, what in the world is going on? And, yeah. um, and over the years, I have met a few different people. Uh, that probably a lot of us know, Belissa out there having good information. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Jennifer Lee and some of her information. And then I met Dee yeah. in this path. <laughs> and so it's been a long road that I've hoed, uh, but with a lot, not a lot of support. So yeah. that's really one of my goals tonight is working here with D is to be on the podcast is to be, tell people there is people out there. You're not alone. Absolutely. And I think that's been one of my biggest challenges is being alone. A, a lot of it. Yeah. And I don't think I really even have till to this day, a good medical professional that has helped me through this. It's and, so hard to find. Yeah. So I also did, um, then I, I never even saw a therapist in my life until after I was on one. I had one therapist tell me, just blow in your hand and breathe in the bathroom, you'll be fine, and take your medicine. I had one, uh, I asked him if there was any type of side effects to medicine. He pulled out some medical book and read it to me and said, nope, nope. Yeah. there's no such thing as side effects to this medicine. No, of course not, of course not. <laughs> um, and then I had one that started to believe me a little bit, and um, that was kind of starting the corner changing. And, but I was many years into my recovery um, before I knew that. So. so how long has your recovery been? 
start um, to finish since you started the benzo? When I started the benzo was in essentially December of 2000, November, December of 2009. Oh, wow. I went cold yeah. turkey in 2010. So I was on them for about 15 to 16 months. We didn't start too far. I started 2008. My first Benzo, so we didn't start too far. Yeah, apart. I mean, I, really, mine was 2008 November, so okay. I, yeah, we were pretty close then. Yeah. So, um, and I went cold turkey in 2010, yeah. and had no idea. Um, we live in a two-story house for those that can't see my house, but is the walking down the stairs. I used to hold both walls to go to work, going, yeah. okay, why am I so dizzy? Why do I feel so weird? And um, I had no clue, and I was like, and everybody just kept telling me, you're just anxious, you have anxiety. I'm like. Okay, but I know there's a lot of people in the world that are anxious that don't have the feeling that I'm having. Yeah. So it's been, I just hit my 12 year anniversary of being benzo free. Congratulations. Well, good for you. So, yeah. but it has definitely been a long road <laughs> yeah. to get to where I'm at. And you still have symptoms today. I do unfortunately still have symptoms today. And as we were talking before we started recording, um, now some of them I, believe are still benzo, some of the tinglings and the numbness and stuff like that. But then I still not have anybody medically to say, you're good some days. I get worked up, I think, in some, I'm not sure what word to call it, PTSD, yeah. <laughs> anxiety, whatever you want from the trauma that we've been through. And currently today I do have a, a very good therapist that I meet with and she's very supportive and believes me. But there has been many times, um, I don't think I've had a very good support yeah. medically. And unfortunately, I know from reading lots of people's stories over the years, um, they have that. Very common, yeah. So. You know, one of the benefits of this conversation I love so much is that we have two caregivers here. And um, I just think that's such an amazing storyline to get, to get that conversation. Um, so I didn't know if, I mean, Shannon was just asking a couple of questions, but... Um, I didn't know if with Heather and Shanna here, if maybe you guys might want to kind of talk a little bit about the, the caregiver side and kind of get that conversation going. So I think that's what's on benefit of the four of us sitting here is this isn't something that just affects those of us who get stuck on the drugs. It affects almost to the same degree people who live with us, us and who have cared for us and have had the courage to stick with us, which is not easy and we understand that. So. Well, and I was thinking with Heather, you can give an even bigger perspective of what it's like to be a mom with younger kids yeah. whose dad is struggling and how that all comes into play. Yeah. So, we were talking earlier, is that there's two things, I guess, about me. One is I'm a fix-it kind of gal, <laughs> and I... Um, I, I want to identify the problem and figure out what I can do to fix it. Um, it's also been said that when people in my family are sick, I give them 48 hours, and then we need to start seeing improvement. And I'm, I'm joking, but I'm kind of not. You know, I mean, I'm a very compassionate, I feel like I'm a very caring person, but I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a nurse. I don't want to be a nurse, and so that's just not my strong suit. So that part has been challenging because at 12 years we're, we're way past the 48 hours that um, you know that Steve gets but I, I think one of the hardest things or, or I guess what I found that I did is you know when this happened our kids were young um, seven and ten maybe okay. and we didn't understand it and I don't oh, I know we didn't really share much with them for a long time because we didn't know what we were sharing um, and so I feel like I tried to, you know, put on the backpack and try to take on more things at home because I knew Steve didn't feel good. And that could be, oh, I'll mow the lawn for you or what can I do for yeah. you? And so I kind of feel like I tried to do that and maybe that was the right thing to do. I don't, I don't know. Um, just within the last few years, handful of years maybe, um, we've talked with our kids at different points about um, kind of the journey. And in some ways it's to say, hey, if you are ever feeling like this in life is tough for you, we need to figure out why. And, and that medication is not, is probably not the first thing to reach for, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we've tried to be very open about, about that. Um, and that is still a work in progress because I think 
Steve doesn't ever want to be the dad who can't do things. So there have been lots and lots of times through this whole thing where I know he has pushed through and done stuff that maybe he shouldn't have done. But that's also, you know. Sometimes you have to do that. Yeah, I, I mean, who can yeah. say that, right? Yeah. Um, so it has been hard. And I think that's still what I struggle with, or that's my, that's my challenge, is how can I best support Steve since there's not a quick fix and what's, you know, what, what do I do? And, and even sometimes what do I say that mm -hmm. will, I don't want to say make him feel better because clearly I don't have the power to do that. But sometimes I struggle, um, kind of, kind of what, what I'm supposed to do, yeah. you know, like how, how can I best support him in what's, happening now. Well, a lot like Steve mentioned, the finding the advice, you know, was so hard yeah. from Doc. It's even worse for caring. I mean, there's less information for how do you care, yeah. how do you take care, how do you live with somebody yeah. with this? Um, I just think that's that's so interesting to kind of get that take. H how did you manage self-care, taking care of yourself during that time? Honestly, I don't think I did very okay. well. Um, my mom, this is sort of an aside, but my mom passed away in July and, um, she had been sick off and on for several years, um, acutely just about six months before she died. Um, and at that point, I think I just realized I am losing it. You know, yeah. I'm just not able to do this. And so for the first time, I started going to see um, a counselor. And that was huge. And it wasn't even so much that the conversation was about benzos. It was just more about me. You know, like right. how I felt and what I was either doing or not doing. And um, I think one of those things that I've not ever been very good at is saying what I need, I think. So I, was, I felt like I was just taking more and more and more on, you sure. know. And um, so that has helped a lot. I, it hasn't solved the problem the medical problem, you know, mm -hmm. but I feel like maybe things are, uh, we're a little more balanced, yeah. you know. Um, I do feel like when I need space, like I'm an outdoor person, so I, you know, I walk with our dog probably three or four, <clears throat> three or four miles, not every day, but pretty often, and I feel like that does help, but I think for a long time, you know, you get caught up in that day-to-day -day life when you have kids, and you just keep pushing through, right. even when you probably should not you know so I, I wish that I had started going to see someone that was outside of my family just for an outside perspective and just someone to vent to that was huge that was really huge for me does that relate to you well I'm kind of curious <clears throat> are there any tips that you're comfortable sharing that you've learned through counseling that might be beneficial to somebody like me well I don't know <laughs> okay. um, no, I, I don't know. Like, the counselor that I saw what, is fabulous. I do really like her a lot. Um, and I think for a long time, I thought by putting everybody before me was the best thing to do. Because I'm okay, but other people need me. Right? Steve needs me. Our kids need me. And that was all true. But I just was running on fumes. So yeah. I think that's important is to say, this is what I need. And I can't do that right now. Whether it's, you know, for your spouse or your kids or even for yourself, you know, I, I'm, I'm not going to do that load of laundry. And I found too that one of my coping mechanisms, which is terrible, is I will just keep busy. Like I can out, <coughs> I can outwork this feeling or I can outrun this feeling, which you can't, you know. So I think stopping and just saying, you know what, this really sucks right now, and this is a really hard time right now, is important to do because I think for me, I always wanted to be okay, you know? And if I admitted that I wasn't okay, mm -hmm. then I don't know if I thought things were just gonna fall apart, but I think that's a, that's been a big part for me is to say, I am not having a good day. I mean, I think, you know, we try to be very positive with each other, and, and I think that's good, but I think it's okay sometimes to say, this is a really bad day, 
you know, this is a really hard thing. Um, and to just be able to verbalize yeah. kind of how you're feeling and what, what you need. And to say, I'm sorry you feel like this, but I don't know what to do. And it's okay to, it's okay to say, I need this, or I need to ask for this, it's to say what you need yeah. to get through. And sometimes, yeah, as we've learned, you know, they can't always be there for us, you know? And I don't know how you felt about that, Steve, but it's like, I felt that too, where it's like, you know, I think that burden of what I'm doing to her is a whole nother layer that's on top of what we've gone through. Have you felt that way too? De definitely. Um, it's, yeah, it's a whole nother layer. And again, as you said, in regards to having children and so yeah. on and so forth, it, and again, when I didn't know what I was dealing with myself until recent, I mean, and recently in regards that we've come out that I've 12 years benzo free, it was anywhere from five to six years of not knowing what I was dealing with. I just felt like I was anxious. And, and that's what you were being told. And that's what I was being told. And it was yeah. just like, but, and you know, and they'd go through all the questions. Do you have this? Do you have marital? No, no. Money? No. House? No, no. Food? No. And it was like, wait a second. So what am I so, but it was just really mm -hmm. health that I was worried about. But when you get a muscle twitch or a brain zap or whatever, it's really hard to stop your fight and flight yeah. from kicking in and going, what's going on? Is this going to be the big moment? Am I going down? Um, those have gotten farther apart, but I'd love to say that they're gone, but they're not for me. Um, but if I get busy sometimes, I can control it. But I think I'm controlling it, but I'm really not. And it's that's there's a big difference. <coughs> I think that's a good point, yeah, because I do the same thing. It's like I think it's all fine, and then all of a sudden, I mean, we just, you know... I, we were talking earlier about how Shannon and I started this kind of trip a couple of weeks ago. And for the worst, first week, we were really sick with this respiratory virus and kind of taken down. And now we're kind of recovering, but we still got the cough. And we were in my, um, my, cousin's, my cousin's son's wedding. Um, and I had, a, I had an almost all-out panic attack. And I haven't had one of those in a long time. But we were sitting third row. Service just starts. They come down, ministers there, and he's waiting, and she's coming down, and they start their vows, and I get a coughing attack. I can't easily get up and leave, and I started to sweat. I started to feel my heart palpitations. I started all this kind of stuff, and I had to cough. I had to cough, and I would, I would wait till they laughed at a comment, and I would cough during the laugh, you know, but I was literally two seconds from getting up and running out the door. Because I felt so trapped, I felt so locked in, my anxiety was so strong, all my symptoms were kicking in. I haven't had that in a long time, but it's scary to know that that still can happen. Yeah, and it, it definitely happens still to me, yeah. where I don't know where I can be literally sitting somewhere, and all of a sudden I'll just get dizzy, or I'll get a, as we call them, waves, and it's just like, whoosh, this feeling will come in. Oh, yeah. Or we'll be watching TV, or... Drive. I mean, it just, it just, you just never know when from a toe to the top of your head is going to hurt and yeah. stuff like that. And most of mine now um, is not the dizziness. Like I don't have to hold myself going down the stairs anymore. But is more of just the muscular and I would call it the nerve endings, really yeah. trying to come back to life. Yeah. Where you know they'll get that burning sensation and then sort of itch and then. They might stop or they'll move to somewhere else. And, you know, as my therapist that I see or whatever, she says is try to not go snipe hunting. Not oh, to look old, for... Good old snipe hunting. Yeah. yeah don't <laughs> look for the answer. Just yeah. know that it's going to go away. Know you're healing. But there are some times I'm going to full on snipe hunt. And, yeah. you know, we, Heather and I use that analogy now together. It's easy where she can say, don't go snipe hunting right now. Just remember you're fine. Today's today, you only have to do this or what <coughs> you have to do. And um, I'm proud to say that, and I'm also kind of like, I'm not going to say embarrassed, but I'm not really the right word, is really through all this, I've never stopped. I've been able to work through it all, yeah, that's which amazing. has been really amazing because there were some really bad days, really bad days. And I've coached a uh, couple different sports through this, and there were some really bad practices where... You have to try to put on that smiley face for X number of your age child that is, you know, trying to learn and be positive or whatever. Exactly. You know, and again, Heather always says, how do you remember back to when they were 
this age. And there's a lot of memories from this trauma because that's really what we've been through is a trauma. And we're dealing with grief from... Exactly. Um, yeah. And the one way the therapist explained it to me, she's like, you envision your life to be this, but you really only wound up with this. And that bridge in between is what you're upset and you grieve that you've lost. Yeah. You know, and again, even with children, I grieve sometimes in regards to was I right for them? Was I strong enough for them? Mm -hmm. Did I lead them down the right exactly. path? Exactly. Yeah. You know, because it's not, unfortunately, most of us that are dealing with it have other people that are really affected. Yeah. And good or bad, I've kept it away from pretty much most of our friends. Almost all of them. Yeah. And some of my family for a long time. And really just now recently trying to become an That's advocate. That's a great topic. Yeah. So, uh, have you, so you've started to talk more openly about it is what you're saying? A little bit. And how's that gone for you when you as you started to do that? I don't have as big of waves usually with them. But right. there's some days where I just don't feel right. Yeah. And um, I haven't really shared a lot with it because it hasn't been a situation where I've had to, um, but again, our children know, um, and I know recently we moved our son, in, and he says, how are you doing today? And I said, yeah, kind of hurt, and he's, he thought it was just the legs. I said, no, it's kind of hurting from head to toe <coughs> today, and so uh, we have asked both of our children to watch the movie Medicating Normal. Um, Good. Um, more, of, again, what we want them is education, right. is we don't want them to fall into a here's the pill. This will fix everything. And again, when Heather was at my appointment when I was offered it, and the doctor was somewhat open in regards to it, in regards to saying, I'll have you fixed by five o'clock. And I'm like, finally, somebody that's going to fix me. And we didn't know what that, was we didn't know what that is. No. And literally we stopped at the pharmacy and then we had a carnival at the school that night. And I thought I was the mayor of the town. Yep. Because I was, I was stoned, for lack of a better word, out of my mind. I was walking around and just having the best time talking to everybody. And then that was the only day that I would ever say I remember ever feeling great on the medicine. There'd be no problem if these drugs didn't work somewhat. Yeah. You know, because oh, no, the, they problem, the problem is they work quickly. They just don't work consistently. And then you get tolerance. And we all know what, what that goes after that. Exactly. But yeah, the problem is, is that they do work initially, and that's why so many people are in such a bad state. Right. And again, it, when I was first on them, and I, I couldn't even tell you to this day how many milligrams I was on. Yeah. I don't, I don't know, because I didn't know it was a bad thing. Right. I just took it as which prescribed. One, which drug, repeat your, and I was on clonopin. Cl yeah. Same as myself. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure everybody knew that, so they knew yeah. it. But yeah. But the thing with clonopin, as we know, it's one of the most potent benzos. Correct. And so if you're taking that, even if you're taking 0.5 milligrams, you're still taking 10 milligrams of diazepam or Valium. If you're taking 1 milligram, which is, you know, these are lower doses that they have of those, then you're taking 20 milligrams of Valium. So it's a very potent drug. Correct. So if you're taking just 1 milligram, you're taking a lot. Right. And I was taking it three times a day at start. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. So we take it like 7 in the morning, and then take it at lunchtime, and then take it at bedtime. And a week or two weeks in or whatever, I finally called the initial doctor and said, the one at, can I stop taking the one at lunchtime? Because I'm not almost making it through the day at wake. Because it literally, oh gosh, I wanted to yeah. fall asleep immediately. Um, and again, she did say, yes, just take at least the morning and night. But I mean, two seconds after I took that, I was ready to go to bed. Yeah. And again, when we had young children, I was going to sleep with them pretty much. You know, it was like, so it's, it's hard to remember all the way back that far, but there's still a lot of memories. And, but there's also a lot of blank spots in some of those memories, one just from time, yeah. but there's also, I think the medicine had really made my memory be a little bit shady. Yeah. I think it's interesting, especially with, with, um, with you, Heather, is what would, it, I'm kind of curious as far as people, especially spouses and everybody else that's getting into this, of somebody like that, you know, I think what I'd like to know is what upfront, you know, just for the, you know, somebody says, oh my God, I just found out my husband or my wife or my fiance you know, has been on this drug for three years. What do you tell that person just up front? And it's for you too, Shanna, it's for both of you, is what would you want to share with them right off from the start? Yeah. Well, I, I, don't, I, I don't know really. I, I, I say that because I, I still feel like I'm struggling 
to know what to say now, Understand. all these years, yeah. you know, down the road. But I think, um, I think educate yourself. And that, I think, uh, Steve is a great researcher of things. So I, and you know, he reads and he tells me and, and I, um, I'm, I look for things, you know, so I would say educate yourself. The second thing I would say is to try to find a doctor who knows something about this. Okay. And um, like you mentioned, we live just outside of Cedar Rapids. It's not a, a terribly small town, but it's certainly not a metropolitan area. And so that has been, um, that has been challenging. And with that challenge also comes you know, the network of doctors here. If one, you know, they all, you sort of feel like they all kind of know each other yeah. and what do they know? And, and I, I don't know, you know, how much are they willing to say something that goes against what maybe one of their colleagues has, has said. But I think finding good medical, a good medical professional would probably be the very most important thing. And I, from what I understand, that's very hard to do. It's hard, but it's, but it's worth the time. I agree with you, and I think it's worth the time. And I think for Steve, that's, um, I, th I think that's been the hardest part, yes. you know. Um, uh, uh, seven years ago, I was diagnosed with breast cancer and um, had a fabulous, fabulous medical team. And um, it was, a, I mean, the cancer was not a blessing, but this medical team was fantastic. And I would go to my oncologist and she, if I had, you know, really I went in and I cried every time I went in for like three years because I was convinced something was wrong. But every time I would go in, she would say, nope, this is what it is and this is what I've read and this is what the you know research says. And so she was very reassuring. Um, and Steve, like we've said, he's never had that. And he's like, if I just had somebody who could say, you know, what you're feeling is normal. And <coughs> this is the path, you know, you're on the right path. Um, and I think that single-handedly would probably be the most important thing for him, even yeah. at 12 years out, if he could find someone even tomorrow that would say, this is what you have, and yes, you're on the right path. I think psychologically would be a huge lift for him because I think the struggle of not knowing what it is or how long is this going to last, I think that's yeah. been really debilitating, honestly. Like, Absolutely. I think that's been the biggest challenge. So, so your original question to you was, if you somebody told you a friend that they had been on a benzo or on a benzo and they've been on for a while, what would you recommend them? I'd like to add on to that question. I think... One, the medical would be huge. Try to find somebody that can help you. I'm actually still, today's Sunday, month, Wednesday, I'm going to see a new doctor on the phone, a functional medicine functional doctor. doctor. Okay. Functional. And just, we're having a conversation with that person just to see if it's the right thing for right. me. But we're still looking for somebody to say, okay, give me a full workup. Tell me I'm okay, but not make me feel like I'm, I'll essentially use the word crazy, yeah. that these pains are happening because... My current doctors that I've seen over the years sometimes look at me like, no, no, that's not, you're fine, get out of here, pretty much. And sometimes that 11-minute time slot is crazy. Yeah. Um, but the, the biggest thing I would tell people also is do not go cold turkey. Yes. And I don't care if it takes you, if it takes you three years, four years to wean off, if you have to shave those things, but it's just to say, you know what, start that journey instead of going cold turkey. Because cold turkey, not recommended. Doesn't work well. It does not work I well. We and, yeah. and I don't. I still don't know how I did do what I did. I really don't. I don't know how I went to work every day. And I'm telling you, there was days driving that I didn't feel right. There was days sitting at a computer I didn't feel right. Yeah. There was panic attacks. There was lots of things. There was soreness. There was days where my legs felt so sore coaching I'm like how am I standing here you know and I just but I didn't want and I think there was somebody out there I didn't want the drug to label me I wanted to fight through it I mean I just didn't want to be you know I don't know you and want again, to be sick. I didn't want to be sick is the word we use even though yeah yeah no I'd say that's a good point yeah, yeah. 
So again, but to wean as slow as possible. So your body has that time to let your central nervous system rejuvenate adjust, and yeah. adjust. And again, there's some people out there, um, benzo buddies are, oh, I'm off 12 months, I'm healed. I'm like, yeah. okay, I'm 12 years. You know, and it's... And there um, are people who come off this pretty simply. And there, there's and a I, lot of I, people that, yeah. And, and that's amazing and wonderful and it's also really hard because it makes our story that much less believable sometimes because Correct. they often say oh but so and so comes up well yeah there are some people but there also are some people who it can take months and years absolutely you know and we all know that because we've all been experiencing this right did you so, have, want to add something yeah, yeah. So when you asked heather and me what advice that we would give to a caregiver just learning that they're about ready to become a caregiver I absolutely agree with you, Heather, about educating yourself, kind of knowing what's coming, or at least knowing that you're not going to know what's mm -hmm. coming, and that the random weird symptoms are all probably related to the same thing, so don't freak out and run to the ER every single time. Yeah. Um, I think the other, <clears throat> two other thoughts came to mind, and that is um, believe your loved one when they tell you that they're struggling, that this isn't something they're making up. Um, and today it may feel like heart attack symptoms and tomorrow it may be dizziness and the next day it may be difficulty your foot hurts. I mean, it's just random weirdness. But just to believe the person that you're living with is, is struggling. And then the last for me, I don't know if you found this Heather, is being flexible that you might have a schedule in mind, you might have a family gathering or some event that you're planning to go to, and if the person that you're dealing with here who's got some benzo issues is just not feeling up for it, then you need to be able to either decide to go on your own or grab somebody else to go with you in their place, and, and just to be okay with that, even though it might be disappointing. You know, I think when you're told over and over again there's nothing yeah. wrong with you, you sort of start to believe there's nothing wrong with you. So, you know, in your head you say, well, if there's nothing wrong with me, well then, yeah, I don't feel great, but I can still go. Where, you know, in hindsight, we say, oh my gosh, this, so many, if we could do this over yeah. again, oh, which yeah. we don't obviously want to do. Uh, how many I'm not things, recommending that, many, yeah, but you know, it's something. How many things would we probably do differently? Yeah. You know, but you don't know, you don't know what you don't know. Yeah. And, you know, when everybody is saying, this can't possibly be what you're saying it is. Yeah. You don't necessarily believe it, but you start to question yourself, like, is this really, can this really still be it? You know, is there really, you know, something else going on? And Steve will sometimes still say that. Is there something else going on? And, oh, I constantly wonder you know, that. Yeah, and I just, something You know, else? now I just say, there isn't. You know there isn't. You just aren't feeling well today. This is how you're feeling today. But it's not. Yeah. You know, don't go snipe hunting. Yes, you know, honey, you call it snipe hunting. We call it the heat-seeking missile. Okay. So <laughs> yeah, looking for something. Yeah. It's gotta be that's something. Not there. There's gotta be something there. No, there's yeah. nothing there. Okay. Well, like you said yeah. too, it's like we really don't want there to be anything else. No. You know, we don't want to. You know. Yeah. Well, something minor. Right. You know, that you could take care of with. Yeah, yes. exactly. But nothing major. No. You know? Hangnail's okay. <laughs> yes, yeah, right. the hangnail. Hang <laughs> so that was that, that whole thing was a hangnail. Oh no, that's okay. Yeah. Yeah. We can get that fixed. <laughs> yeah. And I do, I, you know, in hindsight, too, I just think I wish that we had been um, a little bit more open with our community of friends and felt like okay. it was okay to say, you know what, we're going to cancel tonight yeah. yeah, because, you know, Steve's just not feeling great or something has come up. And that's what it usually was for us was, I mean, what she's referring to a lot of times, especially with her family, because we mm -hmm. live near her family and not near mine, but... Um, I think a lot of that time it would be like she would go to her folks or something mm -hmm. like that and she'd do you want to go and then sometimes I'd say, you know, I'd rather stay here. It's not that I couldn't have, yeah. but I knew I was going to be better off the next day at work yeah. if I had some downtime and some time to kind of re-energize and I would be better the next day. So, you know, there were several times or there'd be a, a, a birthday in the family or something and, you know, D was missing because he just couldn't be there. And I tried to attend what I could, but I also, I was trying to balance my life and figure out what I needed. And the family, everybody in the family knew, and I was pretty open up front. And I think so that, probably that helped makes, a lot. Would have made a, a big difference. Oh, I think yeah. I, I agree with that. hundred percent different in regards to being, and that was one of my thoughts. I was thinking is being open with more. But again, at first it was like I didn't know I was, like I say, I don't know the exact timeline, but it it was probably close to five years off the medicine, and I still had no idea what I was yeah, dealing so. with. So it, it was so 
disturbing because what am I was going to tell people? Right. Because when I first got yeah. sick, I called a lot of friends. I mean, because I didn't know what was going on. It was this big thing. I mean, I practically called people, friends in other states and was like roommates and stuff like that from college. Like, I'm really sick. I don't know what's going on. You know, but I'll let you know, you know, if I'm going to die, essentially. It was like, that was calling like my last calls to them. And it was like, oh, God, but it was yeah. like, I didn't know what was going on. So that to be open is good. I think our society is coming more open with the, especially the term of, Especially mental health and things related to that. Well, this isn't necessarily a mental health issue, but it's related to it because it's medications that's normally prescribed for mental health. Correct. So, and yeah. again, that again, that would be another five-hour podcast in regards to the it terms and everybody else yep. wants to talk about. And we'll do that the next, yeah, 102, 103, 104. Yeah. Exactly. I do think telling your family is helpful because when you do have to cancel at the last minute, they don't just automatically jump to, man, Steve's just getting flighty, or he's turning into or, a or, jerk. Or he doesn't like us and doesn't right. want to come to family functions anymore, and that's the thing you know, right. didn't want to happen. So. The other thing, kind of the flip side of that, is um, they don't remember, right? If you show up in a wheelchair, it's obvious that something is still happening with you. But with this, it's invisible. That's one of the things you shared with me, which yeah, I love. Yeah, and I forget about it. Yeah. And I live with you, um, and the parents and the extended family and friends, even though they know about it, oh, well, that was that was three months ago. You're still dealing with that? Mm -hmm. yeah. It's a kind of an ongoing having to remind them. The duration is one of the hardest a, things for people to understand. This is a long-term deal. Yeah, yeah, especially for buying for that, you know. And I throw bind in because we're now using this term more often. But of course, for those who don't know, it's benzodiazepine-induced neurological dysfunction, and that's a term we're trying to... But with this bind, that ongoing problem, you know, we're just seeing it's like, yeah, it's hard to have people understand. And even if you can explain it to them, but they still are going to wonder three months later, well, why aren't you over it? I said it lasted years. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, you know, it's just, it doesn't compute because, you know, there aren't a lot of diseases that, that have that. And I think you brought up a, an excellent question. I mean, an excellent point about the, with the breast cancer is, um, I mean, as, that is so horrific and life changing. And you had people to immediately turn to who knew what they were doing and yeah. had the research and could give you answers. Mm -hmm. um, and it's like, God, we, you know, let's, we, we, we wish we could have that kind yeah. of support, and that would be nice. Now, ours wasn't as life threatening, but for some people it is. Our people, yeah. suicidality is pretty high. But overall, it wasn't as immediate, you know, as far as life threatening. But it's a, but the duration does carry on for a long time, and that makes it, you know. And when we don't have somebody who out there says yes, you know, you know what's going on, it, it becomes difficult yeah. over time. Yeah. yeah. But for those who are hearing this, we we're sitting on a patio here in their lovely home, and the rain's coming down just around us. So we're not getting wet, but I'm just loving that. <laughs> so we got this rainstorm coming through, and it's kind of nice ambient. So if you're hearing that, you'll know what it is. It's just a rainstorm hitting right now. So. <laughs> It's, it's a relaxing podcast. With it, the yeah, right? yeah, everybody now just kind of mellow out. Right? <laughs> can kind of ease it's down. Turn into into a meditation the, yeah, here, exactly. Right? Yeah, I just lower the voice and then we start talking about mellow now. <laughs> <laughs> but again, I think the biggest thing, one of the biggest things is support. Yes. And is it really, yes. if you listen to what we've all talked about, is support coming up through all these different things. Yeah. And when you don't have support from your medical, and then you sh you shun from telling people because you don't know what to tell them and you don't have support from your friends and stuff like that. It's just really support. So again, I would tell people to find the best support system they can. Yep. And it can be from, you know, a therapist. It can be from your best friend. It can be from your spouse. Yep. It can be from a um, massage can, therapist. Yeah, exactly. You know, again, lots of different things. You almost have to build a team around yourself to help us all through this. Yeah, and a key a point on that thing too is one of the things that we, as us who go through this, Steve, I think, and it's, it's hard for me to say this because a lot of people just don't want to hear it, but we also need to be cognizant of what we're doing <laughs> to people around us and to understand that and to give them some flexibility and, and say, hey, this is, I, I, always say, I always say in the podcast that this is a tough ask. It's a hard ask to ask somebody to go through this with us. It's a big, that's really a big thing. And so if you want that support team, and trust me, you need that support team, as we all know, um, you need to do your best like you have. Sometimes you got to power through, and I think that's perfect. You need to also do your best sometime to make sure that, you know, 
you're also caring for their needs to some degree because they're, you're still in a two-way um, partnership or, you know, our family or whatever else. But I think we get so wrapped up in ourselves and for good reason. I mean, this is an all-consuming type of thing. Um, and I, just, I feel like it, it becomes so selfish, not in a bad way, but just we can't think of anything outside of ourselves. But we need to try to remember we're affecting other people, mm -hmm. and they're also going through this with us. And it's important to let them know frequently how much you appreciate them being there for you. And I think that's the thing I always want to make sure I emphasize. Yeah, and I think there was a question stated earlier also in regards to tips that you've learned. And, I mean, I have literally tried anything throughout this yeah. to get all the feelings to go away. Um, but is to self-care, I think, is so important even for us. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I've learned different breathing techniques now are very important. I meditate now every day and have for, oh, I think, great. 150 days straight or something now where oh, I just awesome. take seven minutes and usually it's my morning break from work. I just take it, yeah, it get out of my chair. Take much, yeah. You know, and I go sit in a different chair and I turn on a provider's meditation yep. and I just listen to it and just try to, you know, just do that. But again, is to try to do some of that stuff. Um, I have not done this perfect. <laughs> You know, I've tried to do the movement, I've tried to do no, do no alcohol, I've tried to do no yeah. caffeine, I've tried to do no, no sugars, no, yeah. as we look at a plate of cookies. <laughs> yes, yes, I know. <laughs> and I'm going to have another. No, <laughs> I've had two so far, but I'm looking at that third. <laughs> but that's a good point of what you're saying right now, because this is where we get into the success and the positivity, which is, here we are, we both were on these drugs for a long time. You came off them quickly, you didn't know what was going on. I kind of planned mine, but I've been off it for eight years now. And here we are, sitting with these great people. Absolutely. On, on a patio, having pizza, having cookies, and enjoying ourselves. All right. And this happens, it, you get there, you get to this stage. Yeah, we still, Steve and I still have problems sometimes. Correct. But we are living a more full life. We're starting to get back to our lives. We're getting to a new life, even a better life, I think, in some degree. Oh. Some degree. And it's, so it, it happens. It just, it can take time for some of us. But Absolutely. And again, I don't want to scare anybody yeah. of your listeners in regards to the 12 years and stuff like that. And there's been periods where I've had big windows where yeah. it might even last for no more than 30 days, but I've had a window where it's yeah. been 30 days where I'm like, wow, or this and that, or... Yeah, I remember this... we chatted through some of those. Yeah. I know, yeah. Yeah, no, there's been days that yeah. we have chatted through, and then there's been days where I want to crawl into the corner and cry. Exactly. I mean, and I hate to say that, and there's been many tearful days. So, yeah. but those emotions are good, um, and I think they help us heal, yeah. you know, and, you know, and even being sleep being important and stuff like that, and if, you know... I mean, I've read so much and stuff about benzos, but also <coughs> tried to really learn about what's good for my health for the long term. And I think that's just um, been I think great. That's key. Yeah, we got to take care of ourselves, and including the caregivers. We got we all need to make sure. You know, I, I honestly that's been my slip up is I kind of let myself go. I gained some weight. You know, taking care of my folks was a hard year um, back and forth to Kansas City, and I let my I just didn't have time to do the self care. And I'm now paying that price, and I've gotten a lot of more symptoms have come back, and I'm not feeling as well. We both got sick, and, you know, I can see I'm paying, you know, the bill for that, but I think that self-care is so so essential. And one of the things I want to mention on this is, um, those that don't know, Steve and I have been not just emailing, but chatting on, on phone for a long time and become really good friends. And um, he's the one that first started sending me these dad jokes. <laughs> and, and the jokes on, and he would do it every day, and he still does it now and then, and it's like, and those are corny corniest damn jokes and I love them and every day you made me smile I show them to my to Shanna and it's remembering to do those things too is one of the things I got caught up in the middle of this was I almost felt like I was I know it's a, it's a weird term cheating on my condition if I enjoyed a moment does that make sense to you at all it does make sense to me because sometimes wait I'm sick I should feel exactly like, like all of a sudden I got wait I just had a window and it was I felt good I didn't think about it for and again, I can go back, and this is the way my memory works, where I remember telling my first doctor that took me off cold turkey, I'm like, I, I struggle all day, all day, and all of a sudden I'll get like 15 minutes. Yeah. Now I'll get hours. Yeah. Now I'll get days. 
Now, I sometimes get weeks. Yeah. You know, unfortunately, and I think a lot of us, mornings are the roughest. Yes. And now by the evening, okay, I get more tired than I used to. And some of that we have to remember is age and is other things because I haven't kept myself in the best shape either due to right. the sore foot, the jabbing this, the, the back, whatever else it is. So, But then we also beat up on ourselves a lot too because we, we think it's there and stuff like that. But I think I it's important to take that self-care, try to move forward, but the good times are coming. I know they're coming. I know I'm healing. Um, well, because if you and I, if we both look back a ways, we can see where we came from. Right. And we're already so much better than we were. And I, I know, um, Heather, you probably can see the same thing. It's like how far Steve has mm -hmm. come. Yeah. You know, at this point. Yeah, absolutely. I, and, and I think, I think sometimes it's easy to forget that. Yeah. You know, when you're in the moment yeah. of, you know, either uh, the person isn't feeling well or you're, you know, you're watching this and you just think, oh my gosh, is this ever going to end? And so sometimes, you know, I'll say to Steve, okay, remember last week, you had several good days. Yeah. So I think that's, you know, it's, it's important to remind mm -hmm. each other and remind yourself, like, this isn't doom and gloom, even if you're having not the best day. Um, but it's, the better days are becoming more frequent. You know? And that's why his jokes were so good, because they could pull me out sometimes. I'd get one, and it's like... And like I mentioned earlier, it's like I would have that thought of, oh, wait, you can't be happy. And then I finally started to realize how ridiculous that was. Yeah. And then I started to do the opposite. I started to embrace that and build on that and say, damn it, no, I can be happy. I can enjoy myself for a little bit. Yeah, it may not last yeah. more than two minutes, but I'm going to embrace this and, and, you know, just kind of suck the nectar out of this <laughs> moment as much as I can. Because they don't, you know, and then they, that would actually create more over yeah. time. And it kind of builds on itself. But I think a lot of us have that wall. It's like, oh, my life is miserable. I'm wondering if you even face that with, with your diagnosis, too. It's like you get so negative sometimes, yeah. it's hard to see beyond it. Well, I, I do. I don't remember that so much. Okay. Although I'm sure, yes. But the last couple of years in our family have been pretty difficult. Obviously, COVID. Yeah. Um, if you, I mean, we talked about the derecho. Yeah. Um, Explain that to them. They don't, they don't yes, know what that's so in. two years ago in August, so August of 2020, this horrific wind and rainstorm came through Iowa, kind of started, I think, as far as yeah. kind of the Nebraska border. Yeah. Like, I know it came through Des Moines and the, you know, central Iowa, but like hurricane strength winds, um, people were out of power for days and weeks for some people. Lots of trees down, lots of damage. Um, we both had our parents living with us for yes. a period of time. Um, my mom was ill, like I mentioned before. And I, I was really, all we could talk about was how terrible things were, yeah. right? And the more you talk about how terrible things were, what did you expect? Well, you expected more terrible things yeah. to come. So uh, that, I, I mean, we really talked about how we... We didn't create the bad situation, but we certainly didn't help it, right? That's like the way point. we viewed it, I think made a difficult, stressful situation worse because we really, we talked about it and we, we dwelled on this really is crappy and this is horrible and this is, you know, the worst time ever. And so what did we get? We got the worst time ever, you know? Yeah. So I do think trying to find the good even if it's just a little bit of time and i think sometimes you, you sometimes have to fake it you yeah. know so like for me as a caregiver i may be like at my wits end and just frustrated and tired really of hearing about this for the nine millionth time because <laughs> exactly. i do because yeah. i do and I, that probably I think we all know that horrible. yeah that no but it's true it's horrible. true she said something very similar but to me many times i just you just have to say <laughs> and i do try to say okay Yep, I know you're not feeling well right now. I know you're not having the best day, but it is just how you feel right now. Yes. It's not how you're going to, you don't even know if you're going to feel like this in 10 minutes or in two hours, yeah. you know, and remember two days ago we did X, Y, or Z and that was fun and you felt good. So it's just sort of, even if you're not feeling it, sometimes you just have to say it. Do you know what yes. I mean? You, you may not even be feeling the positiveness, 
but sometimes you have to fake it. You yeah, know, like right now just... is a tough moment. Right. Remember, it's just a moment. It's just a and moment. And it could be 10 minutes from now, and you could start feeling right. better. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. So no, you the... only had to hear about it for 9 million times? I don't even know. <laughs> I think it's probably more than 9 million. <laughs> I forgot what your number was up to. I think it was it was a double you, double million yeah, digits there. I think yeah. Chart. I think you said thirteen the other day, but thirteen million. I don't know. No. But, you, but this is something that I just as a more serious note, I guess this is something that I though really do struggle with. Is sometimes I struggle with my frustration. Yeah. You know, because I do a hundred percent believe that this is what it is, and I a hundred percent wish that this wasn't happening in our family. Yeah. And I wish 100% that I could do something to take it away. And I can't, and I recognize that. But there are still some times where I'm like, I am so frustrated with what's going on. Yes. And I get irritated with oh, yeah. Steve, and I get irritated with myself, mm -hmm. yeah. and why am I? Why is this still happening, or what, what could we be doing differently? And the yeah. answer is nothing, you know? But there are times more than I would like to admit, probably, where I do you know get that way and then i i feel guilty yep. sometimes for feeling that way yeah. or you know what have what have i done what could i have done differently did i do something wrong and really the answer is what i, I didn't give him the pill i didn't you know none of these things are exactly. my fault no, not. but i do I, I do struggle with guilt. I think you kind of were nodding throughout that whole conversation. Yeah, I, I think there's times when I get frustrated because we have to change our plans, mm -hmm. and it's something that I've really been looking forward to, and yep. now we're not going to be able to do because you're not feeling up to it, and I'm irritated about that, and then I realize, well, I'm not the one that's going through this. Mm -hmm. I'm not the one that's feeling whatever it is that's preventing us. But it's still affecting us. you. Right. Yeah. But it kind of puts things in perspective for me that, yeah. wait a minute, I'm mad about something that's not happening that I want to happen. I don't have to deal with this 24-7 like yeah. you guys do. And so who am I to complain about this little thing when you're dealing with this 24-7? So but you still need to be able ongoing, to, yeah. It is. It's kind it's of a, a battle. It's yeah. an ongoing back and, and forth. I get that. But you, you need to be able that. to, though, because ours shouldn't always trump you. You, got, you know, you guys need to be able to vent about that. You need to be able to deal with it because that's not what we want. You know, we don't want to be always our needs trump yours because that's the last thing. You know, well, that sounds good on paper initially, but it doesn't work out well, no. <laughs> But it's, it's it's one of those things that it's it's a good point. But I think we all there's plenty of guilt on this thing to go around. Trust <laughs> yeah. me. Yeah. I think also now, when I have windows that are really good, and uh -huh. some really good windows, um, and it could be an hour, six hours, two days, or whatever. But I get more frustrated when the bad stuff comes back. More frustrated, yeah. only because I know what good feels like. Yes. There was such That's a period true. of time on That's the medicine true. or. Mm -hmm. For years after off the medicine, that I felt bad all 24 hours, that I'm so frustrated. So I'm like, I did nothing, you know, and I feel so good or this and that, and all of a sudden it's like, boom, you just yeah. don't know when it's going to hit you. Well, that yeah. that last year of taking care of my folks, it's like I really felt that I was 80, 85 percent healed, doing great, but that's the level of stress for that long, that many trips, taking care of, them, and then they're both passing. It's like, okay, that I, I, there's two things. One is I'm amazed that I got through that. And that showed how far I'd come. I was also really surprised at the wave that hit me and how many symptoms I've been dealing with since then and the setback that I had because of it. Totally understandable. What I went through, it makes sense. I should have saw it coming. But still, it's depressing. And like even at the wedding, I had to ask my cousin, you know, she wanted us to sit in the third row. And I wanted to tell her I wanted to sit in the last row. And we wound up sitting in the third row because she told me the service was 20 minutes long, which it was. And then I wound up having a coughing fit, causing an anxiety <laughs> panic attack. So something brand new came along. And But if I'm not stressed, I'm actually kind of normal in the urinary function things. But when I think about it and I start to get stressed and I start to get, I wind up and that's part of my thing. But that limits things that together we can do. For me, one of the things that happened through all this was, and it isn't a negative thing, but I talk about lowering the bar, meaning that what it takes to make me happy now is far less than what it used to take to make me happy. Now you've said that a lot. Yes. And I, I, I feel like I'm glad you said that because it's like that's what I've, I've seen. It's like I find joy in the smaller things so much more now. 
in the daily things in life than I ever did before. I think that's a real positive thing that comes out of this. Yeah, I think, you know, I've read that, you know, you'll be changed when you get through this yep, and so absolutely. on and so forth. Or so many people. I know there's things that I'm, again, happier by yeah. simple things. Yeah. Sitting outside during a rainstorm with a cool this breeze. This right here is awesome. It's like, Sitting yes, it's perfect. guys in the rainstorm. It's a perfect meeting. Your wonderful cookies. It's like, it's perfect, man. <laughs> exactly. So, but again, I think you're so overwhelmed by all the negative feelings and the right. sensations that we go through that you forget those. Yeah. You know, and again, like I said, I've listened to lots of different things to try to help the brain fix and stuff like that. I'm probably even putting more pressure on myself, but I've also learned a lot of different yeah. trips and tricks that will help me hopefully for a much longer period of time. Right. And, you know, and we'll never know that, but you know, you have to hope that those little things yeah. that our science has taught us, the breathings, the meditations. And if you keep those going, they really do improve your life in the long run. You know, and yeah. again, that's why I think as we talked about with our children is we're trying to just educate them so they don't get go down the same path. Yeah, and again, exactly. we've all read how many people have been put on benzos and even in the last Especially two years. Especially during COVID. I mean, just the numbers spiked during COVID. Of, Correct. Yeah. And was, our when is that wave going to hit, you know, and everything else, yeah. our society? I don't know, you yeah. know, but I, you know, the amount of information that's available now is immensely, like, so much more. So much There more. was hardly anything. Yeah, studies, study after studies are now coming out. There's a lot of research happening. There's so many organizations now that are doing so much good. Um, you mentioned Baylissa and Jennifer up front, awesome coaches that are out there helping people every day. There's a lot of people out there providing support. Yeah, I mean, and, a lot of support. Yeah. But literally, I remember when I first figured out that I thought this was my problem, mm -hmm. um, going to YouTube or whatever and tell, typing in Benzo Success and hitting, you know, like, anything in the next last week, nothing. Anything in the last yeah. two weeks, nothing. If you do that today, you might get six, 20 hits that have been oh, yeah. in the last two days. Yep. I mean, and it's just wow. amazing. It now, really again, is. a lot of them yeah. are just videos of people's yeah. stories, stories. Truth, which, again, yeah. are helpful. And But, you know, but there's also just more information. There is. And what BIC has done and... Vic has done and great a lot things. Of the other, Alliance has done great things. Yeah. Yeah. And all the organizations so, that you're involved in have yeah. done a, an amazing thing. And again, it's just, when is it going to hit and yeah. be big? You know, we've got to get some big name down. Honestly, to push I think it. this year, I feel like more progress has been made this year of things that have come out than we've done in the last five or 10 years combined. And mm -hmm. so where that trend is starting, and now a lot of people will get on the on a lot of times on the podcast or email and say, yeah, but. All these doctors still don't know it, and they're absolutely right. This is going to take a long time, but it's 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 multiplying. You know what I'm saying? Right. It's like before, if it was a one factor, then it would become a two factor. Now it's a four factor, and we're going to get that, and we're starting to make a big difference, and the education is starting to happen, and it is changing. Oh, it, it's it definitely is. Yeah. Yes. So I'm really happy about that. I, I don't want to carry this on too long. I want to um, close out a little bit, see if you guys have any last words. And number one, I just want to thank you so much for letting us chat here. I mean, this was just, I love this part. This was great. But do you have anything last you wanted to say to the people on the podcast before we close out for both of you? Again, I would just like to leave it more, again, on a positive note, uh, is really look for your, your team and whatever that means to you in regards to a spouse, in regards to friends, in regards to a child, whoever you can help build your team and try to just do some self-care and be open and um, look for that medical provider that hopefully can help you a little bit and so on and so forth because it's not just cut and dry but I think uh, I'm definitely healing um, and it has taken a long time uh, and again try if there's somebody out there listening to this is ready to start taper take it as slow as possible I love it. take yeah. it as slow as possible because if it takes you four years it's only going to help you on the back end and I would never recommend anybody the things that I've gone through anybody not my worst enemy Thanks. So, but I appreciate you coming out and being with us tonight. It's meant oh, a lot to me. It's been my pleasure. Heather? Um, I guess as a caregiver, I think edu education is, a, is super important. And um, I would be the first to say I probably have a lot, I, I do have a lot to learn, you know, still. Um, I think having a, a belief in what's happening like like you mentioned is very important because 
I think Steve would have, would say for a long time, I, I'm not sure you you believe me, and I wanted to believe him, but it's so strange. How yeah, how do we know so this bizarre. is what's going on? So I think the more you know, the better off you are. Um, so I think that's important for everybody. But I also think taking care of yourself is also very important because. It becomes, or it can, it can become an overwhelming task if you feel like you're taking care of yourself or your family and then your spouse as well, you know, and you don't, you, you kind of run out of steam if you don't take care of yourself a little bit as well. So I think finding a balance exactly. would be something I would, you know, That's would recommend. Cool. I like yeah. that. Yeah. Should I do anything you want to add? <clears throat> I think I would just encourage your listeners that, not just for the person who's taken benzos, but also for the caregiver. It's going to get better. Mm -hmm. There's yeah. hope. Yes. There's light at the end. There may be some darker days ahead. There may be some darker months ahead. But ultimately, it's going to get better. And just hang in there. Your body's going to heal. But it's just going to take longer than you want it to. Yeah. Thank you, guys. You guys were great. Thank you so much yeah, for sharing you. your time with us and being on the podcast. And I really appreciate it. Thank you. So I'm going to sign off here. We'll see you guys next time. Wow, that, that was fun. I truly want to thank Steve and Heather for their hospitality, their generosity, and most of all, for their honesty and talking with us on the podcast. This, this conversation was a delight to record and equally a delight to edit and share. Um, I'm hoping you all got as much out of it as I did, just from learning from the two of them and what their experiences were and comparing them to our experiences, my wife and mine. So um, I was just very grateful for it. Before we close out this episode, I do want to um, just dive in real quick to our disclaimer for about 20 seconds. Thanks. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be considered medical advice in any way. The host of this podcast is not a medical professional, nor is he engaged in rendering medical health or psychological advice nor any other kind of personal professional services. The views and opinions expressed by our listeners and interview guests on this podcast, whether read from textual submissions or presented in their own voice, do not necessarily reflect those of the Benzo Free Podcast or of its host. Withdrawal tapering or any other change in dosage of benzodiazepines, non-benzodiazepines, or any other prescription drugs should only be done under the direct supervision of a licensed physician. Our full disclaimer can be viewed on our website at benzofree.org slash disclaimer. Our next scheduled episode is episode 105, and we will return to our regular format for this one. It's been a been a little while. I hope to have it out later this month before we leave on our trip to the East Coast, the end of August. Thanks for joining me today, and I hope you enjoyed today's Benzo Chat and this new um, format that we're going to sneak in now and then to provide some conversations. Keep calm, taper slowly, and take care of yourself. I'll see you next time.